Hey guys, welcome to Wednesday night at Charity Church. I'm Pastor Cameron. Last week we started a series called the Counterculture Series. And what we're doing is we are looking at the characteristics of this culture that we are living in. It is a culture that is the last days. We are living in the last days. And the Bible tells us what the characteristics of the culture will be in the last days. Uh, last week, we looked at 2 Timothy, the third chapter, and Paul warned Timothy. He says, it's going to be difficult to live in the last days. And why did he say that? He said, for men will be lovers of themselves. And then he goes on, he lists, he says, they'll be greedy. And he says, they'll be traitors. And he says, they will be disobedient to authorities. And he says, they'll be unthankful and nothing will be sacred to them. And they'll be haters of good. And they'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power of God. And so there's, there's this culture, there's this list of characteristics that Paul puts there that defines the culture that we're living in. And we as Christians, this listen, this isn't just um, like characteristics that are kind of scattered here and there. There's pockets of selfishness. There's pockets of greed here and there. These characteristics in the last days, as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ, it's going to be, it's going to define the culture. It's going to, it's going to be the culture that we are living in. And I'm telling you, you jump on social media, you jump on the news, you look around you, you interact with people in the world, and you start to realize that these things that Paul listed in 2 Timothy 3 that they are defining our culture. And so we as Christians have a choice. We have a choice. And the choice is simply this. We can fit in and become a subculture where, yeah, we might go to church. Uh, we might call ourselves Christians, but we're not making a difference. We're just fitting in to the, to the culture that we're living in. And if we do that, the danger is, is this culture will just overwhelm us and take us out. I'm just telling you, that's the truth. The other option is this, is that we can stand out. We can stand out and we can be a light and a witness and make a difference in this world. And what do I mean by that? I mean become a counterculture a culture that is diametrically opposed to the current values, characteristics of this last day, of this world. And so, so those are our options. And so I, I want to talk today. Last week we talked about how this culture is selfish and how selfishness is just running crazy throughout our culture and how God has called us to stand out by, by laying down our lives, laying down our lives and becoming selfless like Jesus. So you can go back and listen to that. But today I want to talk about another characteristic that is going to define these last days. And that's this is deception. Deception. And we're going to spend at least a couple weeks on this. But deception may be the number one trait of the last day's culture. It's going to be rampant. I mean, look what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. He says, the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, clearly says that in the later times, in the last days, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. I mean, how deceptive does that have to be for people to abandon the faith? He's talking about the Christian faith. He's talking about faith in Christ. People will abandon the faith. Why? Because they give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, things taught by demons. And you say, I would never, like, who would listen to a demon, right? I'm a Christian. Why would I fall away from the faith by? Because it's deception. They don't come out with horns and a pitchfork 
and you know, they're standing in a pulpit teaching you something wrong, right? They, it's not that obvious. That's why it's deception. They teach things. They use people. The, the next verse says, such teachings come through hypocritical liars. So they work through people. They work through people, and they deceive and lead people astray and away from the faith. And so that's, that's what Paul said to Timothy. But listen to what Jesus said. Because when his disciples asked him about the end times and about the last days, one of the first things out of Jesus' mouth in Matthew 24, he says, Watch out that no one deceives you. Now he's talking to his disciples. And he says in the last days, he's not just talking to the 12. He's talking to people who are following him. You know, he's, he's, he's leaving something for us as well. The Bible was written to us as well. And so he says, watch out that no one deceives you. These men had heard Jesus' teaching. You know, these men had walked with Jesus. You know, they had seen the miracles and the power of God. They seen what God was able to do. And yet Jesus says, hey, look, watch out. Watch out, guys. In these last days, watch out that no one deceives you. He says, you, you could be deceived. So he says, watch out, be aware, be on the lookout that no one deceives you. And so if, if that's Jesus' warning, that's the first thing out of his mouth concerning the last days. And he says, for many will come in my name. They'll come and they'll pretend like they're representing me, claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. And then verse 10 says, and at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And so we need to be aware that deception is out there and that if we're, not, Jesus told us for a reason. Paul told us for a reason. It's in the Bible for a reason. And it's for Christians, because the Bible is clear in the last days that there will be a great falling away. It will be a great falling away from the faith. So we as believers need to be aware that we can become susceptible to deception if we get into pride, if we don't guard our hearts and remain dependent upon God. And, and we need to be aware of that. We don't need to be foolish and think that can never happen to us because it can and, and I, I'm going to tell you, I want to spend the next couple of weeks just going through and talking to you about some different things that distort our vision as Christians and make us susceptible to deception. Because these are the things that we allow in our lives and allow in our hearts. And whether we realize it or not, whether we know they're there or not, whether we recognize it or not, if we allow it in our hearts, these things, then we could easily be led astray and deceived. Easily. And, and, and we need to be aware of it. So I want to talk about two this week, and then next week we'll get into some more. But the number one thing that the enemy uses to deceive us as Christians and to distort our vision, because that's what deception is, we don't see clearly, is offense. That's the number one one tool of the enemy. And you look at what Jesus said in Matthew 24 again. Look at what Jesus said again concerning the last days. And I want you to get your Bible out for this one. If you've got your Bible, you can pause it for a second. Go grab your Bible. Because I want you to underline in your Bible the number of times you see Jesus use the word many. M-A-N-Y. Look at the number of times he uses the word many because he's talking about a lot. This is going to happen to a lot of people, not just like a few. Jesus said many. And so listen to what Jesus said. I'm reading verse 5, and then I'm going to jump down to verse 10, okay? For many will come in my name, I underline many there, saying, I am the Christ and deceive many. Deceive many. This is defining, deception is defining the culture. This is not just happening sporadically. This is happening throughout. So he says, deceive many. And then look at verse 10. It says, and then 
shall many be offended, the King James Version says. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now, I don't want you to limit that word prophet there. You know, obviously it can be someone who prophesies, but can also mean an inspired speaker. And remember, at this point, when Jesus is on earth, the office of a pastor has not been introduced, right? And so that, 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 that term prophet, that false prophet, can be a false inspired speaker. You know, it can come from teachers. It can come from pastors. It can come from pulpits is where I'm getting at. And now that's not to scare you. That's just to say, listen, deception is deception for a reason, you know? And so... He says, many false prophets will rise and deceive many. And he says, and because iniquity will abound, the love of many, underline it, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And so I want to be that person. I want to be the person who endures to the end and is saved. I don't want to be one of the many's right, that Jesus was talking about. But notice the process that Jesus lays out for us. He says, many will be offended. He says, false prophets will arise and deceive many. So offense, deception. And then he says, iniquity will abound or repeated sin, right, a sinful lifestyle, sinful behavior. And then he says, and then he says, the love of many will wax cold of falling away. And so that's it's a process. The deception doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. And I'm telling you, offense is the number one tool of the enemy to get us into deception and falling away. Offense is dangerous for a couple reasons. One, and they go hand in hand, but one, it isolates you. Offense isolates you. You may still attend church, but when, you, when you're offended, there's a disconnect between you and other believers. The only other people an offended person finds themselves connecting to, unfortunately, are other offended people or people that will feel sorry for them and what somebody did to them. And so it isolates you. It isolates you. The other reason it's dangerous and it goes again, right, hand in hand with, with isolation, is because the person begins to focus only on themselves. They focus on what someone did to them. This is ultimately what makes this person susceptible to deception because their vision is clouded. They can only see their hurt, what happened to them, what someone did to them, and they become self-centered and they cannot see clearly, and they can become easily deceived. And they usually, what ends up happening, because offense normally happens amongst Christians within a body, within a congregation, because the enemy uses uh, that offense to get you out of fellowship, to get you out of relationship, not just with God, but with the body of Christ as well. And so what usually happens is that person who's offended they go somewhere else. They find another congregation to go to that will understand them or that won't hurt them or, you know, just, you know, they feel better about, it. especially initially they will. But it ends up happening is because they still have a fence in their heart, they grow sensitive, touchy, they, they're jaded. And what ends up happening over time at that, same, at, at that new place, is they become offended again. They become offended again and because they never dealt with the initial offense. And so what happens, they go from church to church, and to their disappointment, they keep getting hurt by imperfect people, and so they drop out of fellowship altogether. They drop out altogether. And... You know, it, it could have started as just a little offense that they could have gone to somebody and said, you know what, this hurt me or whatever, blah, 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 and talked it out and forgiven or, or you know, whatever was necessary to get, you know, get that right. But 
they let it grow in their heart. And now they're not only disconnected from fellowship, but Jesus made it clear. He says the love of God grows cold in their heart that the love of many would wax cold, would grow cold. And the longer that offense stays in their heart, what happens is they become touchier and touchier. They become more and more jaded and until they until ultimately they deal with it. And so how do we deal? You you first you gotta recognize it. First you have to recognize that there's offense there. You know, if you're touchy, if when when um you know, when, when people are brought up to you, when someone, certain people are brought up, their name is brought up, or they come up in conversation, or you're in their presence, and you sense a, a anger there, a touchiness there, a, a, you know, a, a, a negativity there, then you might have offense there. You may have some offense there. And I'm telling you, it's not something to play around with. The enemy's not playing around. When he brings offense, he's coming to take you out and the next step again is deception and then you you'll find yourself in a place that you don't know how you got there but i'm telling you it started with a fence and so one you got to recognize it and then two you just got to deal with it you got to forgive you if you need to go to the person and talk it out talk it out you need to forgive but you need to repent of that offense and then you need to guard your heart from that happening again and allow God to bring healing to your heart. And otherwise, I'm telling you, you will become deceived. Your vision will become distorted. And because all you're focused on is yourself and what somebody did to you. And you'll be easily deceived. And so that's one way that you can become susceptible to deception is through offense. Another way, and I'm calling this um, you, if you bear with me, but I'm calling it roaming. If you're a roaming Christian, R-O-A-M, roaming Christian, what do I mean by roaming? I mean a half-hearted Christian. You know, as we get closer and closer to the last days, the Bible again says there's going to be a great falling away. And I believe in large part because people will just be roaming. Christians, I'm talking about, will just be going through the motions of Christianity, but they really have stopped pursuing God and stopped growing in their faith with God and in the relationship with God. They're just going through the motions. They're just roaming. They're walking aimlessly through life. You know, the actual original Greek definition of the word deception when you look it up in the in the strong coordinates, it actually means to roam. It means to roam from safety, truth, or virtue. It means to roam from safety, truth, or virtue. You know, when you are roaming, you lack purpose. You're kind of in the middle of nowhere. When you roam, you find yourself places that you did not intend to be. Mainly because you did not intentionally set out for a destination. You weren't intentional. And so today is not the time, the culture we're living in is not the time for half-hearted Christianity. You know, we can't go after God with just like half our hearts and just do this thing half-heartedly. Half-hearted Christianity will get you nowhere fast. And Paul warns Timothy in the last days that men would act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. They would act religious. One virgin says they will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. You know, if you're just going through the motions of Christianity, attending church, you know, maybe you can talk the talk, but you're not in hot pursuit of a relationship with God you are going to be susceptible to deception and to falling away. You know, if you're living off your pastor's relationship with God or your parents' relationship with God, or even this, maybe you're living off the relationship you used to have with God. Maybe you used to be in hot pursuit of God and you used to have that fire in your heart to pursue God, 
but now you're just living off of like an old relationship that you used to have. Remember when, you know, God did this and God did this in my life, but you, it's not there anymore. You're not connected anymore. You're not pursuing anymore. You're just going through the motions. You're just roaming. You're just walking aimlessly uh, through life. Then listen, you're in danger of becoming a Christian statistic. You're in danger of falling away if you're just going through the motions. What's the deception? What's the deception here if you're just roaming and just going through the motions of Christianity? Because you go to church, which is good, by the way, you should, <laughs> but because you go to church or because you grew up in a Christian home or because your pastor's on fire for God, then it makes you think that you're okay with God and that you're in good standing with God, but you're deceiving yourself. You're deceiving yourself. You know, people can and should encourage you. You know, we should surround ourselves with good relationships that can help us in our walk with God and, and teach us and, and, and come alongside of us, but you must develop your own relationship with God. There must be a heart pursuit. Your heart must be engaged in this thing. And there must be a sincerity in your relationship with God. And so I want to encourage you. Listen, if, if you're either one of those, okay, we're going to get into some more next week. But if you've been offended, you know, if you're isolated, uh, if, you're, if you're, 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 you're touchy and jaded, and maybe you're hopping from church to church and you think it's going to get better, but you just keep getting colder and colder in your love for God. Or maybe you're just going through the motions of Christianity and you become just this religious person, just, you know, but there's no heart connection with God. You know, there's no, there's no pursuit of God anymore. There's no pursuit of that relationship with God. Then listen, you're in danger of being deceived. And I don't want that for you. Neither does God. And so I want to pray for you and uh, pray for all of us that God would help us to recognize these things in our lives. Father, I just thank you right now for uh, your people, Father. Thank you that you love your people, Lord. You love your people so much that you've warned us, Lord. You've lovingly warned us that, hey, there's going to be deception in the last days. And so, Lord, uh, we're asking you, Lord, that you would help us, Lord. We're declaring that we are dependent upon you, upon your spirit to help us to see, Lord, clearly, Father, so that we are not deceived, Lord. And Father, if there's any offense in my heart, any offense in anybody's heart that's listening right now, uh, Father, any uh, half-heartedness in our walks with you and our pursuit of you, Father, I'm asking you, Lord, to reveal it. I'm asking you to open our eyes, Lord. I'm asking you to get our attention, Lord, so that we are not deceived, Lord, and that we can walk close to you, Father, and that we can make a difference and that we can stand out in these last days, Father. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.